Welcome back. So in the last lecture, we derived the 1D heat equation, essentially using conservation of thermal energy uh, in a one-dimensional material, a thin metal rod, if you like. And we came up with this partial differential equation, the heat equation, uh, assuming that the material is constant throughout, so it has the constant uh, diffusion coefficient, um, or like thermal conductivity, specific heat and density. So if this is one uniform copper wire, these are all a constant. And this is the diffusion equation or the heat equation for how the temperature U of X and T evolves in space and in time. Uh, and if you have forcing, you know, maybe this thing is radiating heat to the outside, uh, or maybe this is a, a plutonium rod and, and it's creating heat through some fission, th some atomic mechanism, this can account for all of those sources, those heat sources. Or maybe I hit this thing with a blowtorch at some point. This would be a delta function at that point x, as long as the blowtorch is on. So we derived this uh, system, <coughs> and today what I want to do is show you how you would actually solve for the steady state heat distribution uh, given different boundary conditions and initial conditions. So this is really, really important. Um, before I do that, there's something kind of interesting I like to share with my students when I'm actually uh, lecturing about this in class, which is the following. So we actually assumed uh, when we derived all of these equations, you know, this part of the equation here at least, that this was an insulated metal rod. It kind of had some styrofoam or plastic sheath around it so it, it wouldn't uh, radiate to the outside. But this big Q term here actually allows me to include the effect of radiation uh, to the far field. And so if I have uh, an outside temperature, maybe I'll write this uh, in green. So if I have an outside temperature, uh, temperature that is U naught, some you know, ambient temperature of, uh, of the world, then what I have is essentially a Q term that is due to um, you know, rate, uh, conduct, uh, conduction to the environment. So this would look like U sub T equals uh, kappa over C rho minus some constant mu times U minus U naught. Okay, this is just the linear uh, heat conduction. This is kind of Fourier or Newton's linear heat conduction uh, law here. And this is assuming that the outside U is such a big heat sink, sometimes we call it a bath, that its temperature doesn't change because of what's happening uh, due to this, this metal rod here, okay? So we assume that this outside uh, kind of air or, or fluid that this is sitting inside of is kind of infinite, and its temperature never really changes uh, even when this is, is, is dumping heat out into it. Now, that's kind of a crude approximation to what actually happens. If you have a hot metal wire and it's hot enough, it's not just going to conduct with its, uh, its neighbor. And in fact, as it conducts, it's going to create a thin thermal boundary layer that's going to kind of insulate it uh, against the atmosphere. So that's what your skin does. If you're just standing still in a still room and there's not wind blowing, you'll have this kind of thermal boundary layer around you. And even worse, if this is a really hot uh, piece of metal in a really cold environment, then I might actually get thermal uh, convection. The, it might actually cause buoyancy effects in the fluid to cause the fluid to convect. And uh, through, through fluid convection, through mass transfer, actually move heat away. And that would uh, essentially change this coefficient mu to be much, much larger if I'm in the regime of convective heat transfer. So this is just an approximation, a very, very crude approximation. But what I like to point out is that, um, you know, and this is all for the case where the rod is not insulated. So this is all for the case, uh, I'm gonna just draw it where, um, this thing is kind of blasting out uh, heat to its surrounding, either through conduction, convection, or radiation. Uh, and at very, very large temperature differences, if the difference between U and U naught is very large, you know, like hundreds of degrees uh, Celsius, maybe 100 degrees is a bit too much, then this U sub T, oh my gosh, you should have caught me. I know you can't talk through your screen, but this is a UXX here that I missed <laughs> in my equation. I'm actually going to rewrite this because this was a horrible mishap. 
Um, I completely forgot the diffusion part of my equation. Uh, kappa over C rho U X X minus U. Sorry about that. I hope that wasn't too confusing. Okay. If I have a really big temperature difference, so for large uh, temperature difference, so maybe I have you know the sun, you know a star that is really, really hot and it's radiating energy away and it's in a very cold vacuum of space, then this U sub T will still equal uh, kappa C rho U X X inside of the material, the actual uniform material. But now the radiation to the far field, this M U minus U naught, this constant times the difference in the temperature between the object and its environment, uh, and maybe I'll draw here, this is my cold environment here, which is all u naught, that's space. This is to the fourth power. Now that is a big difference. First off, this is a nonlinear partial differential equation now. For very large temperature distribution uh, differences, the heat equation becomes nonlinear. This is a nonlinear radiation, uh, and this is called the Stefan Boltzmann, uh, Stefan Boltzmann law, Stefan Boltzmann. Uh, Boltzmann, like the Boltzmann that uh, derived the coarse-grained gas dynamics equations um, and brought us kind of statistical uh, thermodynamics. And this is a nonlinear radiation term, nonlinear radiation. So it's really important to know how these things work. Uh, if you really, really crank up the temperature difference uh, between the environment too much, you'll get this nonlinear radiative heat transfer, like literally photons will be emitted to carry heat away and it will look like this. And so you have to know when your partial differential equation breaks down. This is a Q term that is nonlinear uh, for really, really large temperature distributions for black body radiation is what it's called. And this was actually really important. Uh, this equation here and kind of this uh, black body radiation equation was really important in how we derived uh, and kind of came to understand quantum mechanics. So there's something called the ultraviolet catastrophe, which basically says there should be infinite uh, energy radiated in the ultraviolet uh, bands. It's a slightly more sophisticated version of, of this theory. But basically with classical physics, it said there should be infinite radiation uh, in the higher and higher frequency bands called the ultraviolet catastrophe. And it required um, quantum mechanics and, uh, and Planck and others to come around to rectify that situation. There's actually a really, really good YouTube video by uh, Physics Girl that talks all about the ultraviolet catastrophe and kind of how that brought about quantum, quantum physics. But the point I really want to make here is that this Q function can also include conduction and convection and radiation to the environment. Conduction and convection and radiation uh, to the environment. Good. Okay, so for the rest of the, the lecture, we're going to talk about how to compute steady state t uh, temperature distributions using Laplace's equation. So for now, let's just assume we don't have any Q. So we're just going to assume that there's no, no forcing, it's an insulated rod, and we just have boundary conditions. And uh, in steady state, in steady state, UT equals zero in steady state. And so essentially what I have is Laplace's equation, which in 1D is really, really trivial. Uxx equals zero. This is uh, Laplace in one dimension. And so we're going to solve for the steady state heat distribution in this thin metal rod uh, using Laplace's equation. But of course, there's something really important I haven't uh, brought in yet. And I think you know, some of you are probably yelling at your screens right now, or you should be. Writing down a partial differential equation is not enough. I also need initial conditions. So my initial conditions, uh, which would be you know, u of x at time 0 equals some initial temperature distribution t of x. That's an initial condition. So what is the initial temperature distribution at time zero when I start my experiment? And then I also need boundary conditions. Boundary conditions. So for example, uh, what happens? What happens at 
uh, x equals 0 and x equals L. What happens on the actual boundaries of this, this thin metal rod? So I know what happens at a little piece inside, but the boundaries are also important. Uh, and so there's a few really important boundary conditions that I want to point out. One of them is fixed temperature. Fixed temperature, where you would essentially say um, u of x equals 0 at time t equals some constant a, and u at the other end at some you know l for all of time equals b. So I'm literally maybe I have some some electronic you know hardware controller that measures the temperature here and adds heat energy or pulls heat energy out to fix this temperature, or maybe I have this uh, sunk in a cold ice bath. You know I, I've taken a little bit of insulation off here and I've dunked this in an ice bath, and I put this in a really really hot bath that are at fixed temperatures. Uh, and we assume that those, again, are kind of infinite heat reservoirs that would fix the temperature. So that's one really important set of boundary conditions. Uh, and the other really important set is insulating boundary conditions. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So, um, so we have fixed, and then we also have uh, insulated. And insulated basically would mean that u sub x at uh, 0 comma t equals 0, and u sub x at l comma t equals 0. Insulated just means that there is no heat flux at point 0 or point l. I put little styrofoam caps on this thing, and so there can't be any heat flux, any flow of heat, uh, you know, in either of these two end caps at x equals 0 or l for all of time. So these boundary conditions are for all of time. My initial condition is at time 0 for all of space, okay? Uh, and so I actually want to show you how you would solve Laplace's equation for these two, uh, these two distributions here. Now, Laplace's equation uh, in 1D is trivial to solve. So I'm just going to solve it down here. So u x x equals 0. Okay? We know how to solve this. We integrate it once, uh, and we get u sub x equals a constant, and I'm going to call that constant 1. And then I integrate it again with respect to x, of course, and I get u is equal to constant 1 times x plus constant 2. All solutions of Laplace's equation in 1D, you know, for these boundary conditions are going to be of this form, because that's what the equation dictates, is that I can have kind of a linear function, and it can be offset by a constant, uh, C2. And so let's look at this for the fixed boundary condition case. So for the fixed boundary condition case, uh, we basically have that u of 0 at x equals 0 has to equal a. So u of 0, which if I plug in 0 here, it's just C2, that has to equal a. So we know, so this is how we fix our constants with our boundary conditions. These are kind of arbitrary constants until we give ourselves boundary conditions. So uh, C2 equals A, and then if I have C2 equals A, then when I plug in uh, L equals B, that means U of L uh, equals A times L plus C2, and that equals B. And so that means I can solve for C2. So uh, C2 equals minus, it uh, equals, um, did I do this wrong? I think I did this wrong. Um, oops, yeah, C, shoot, I definitely did this wrong. Okay, uh, easy to fix, um, not, not difficult to fix, okay? I just need to be a little more careful. We, okay, we evaluated our left boundary condition to find that our second constant is equal to A. Now we're going to evaluate our right boundary condition to find out what C1 is equal to. So plugging in X equals L, I get C1L plus C2, but we know C2 is A plus A, and this equals B. So now C1 equals B minus A divided by L. So now I've uniquely determined my second constant and my first constant just by my fixed temperature boundary conditions. 
Uh, and so we can actually write this out. Um, again, we have our little you know, thin metal rod here. And if the left condition is fixed at temperature A, and if the right condition is fixed at a temperature B, then my solution is uh, U equals this C1, um, B minus A over L times X plus A. So it basically lifts everything up by A, and then it's a line that interpolates between uh, temperature A and temperature B over this length L. So this is the steady state temperature distribution for fixed temperature end caps. So we've solved Laplace's equation in 1D, and then we used our boundary conditions to solve for these arbitrary coefficients to get this uh, linear temperature profile. And if A was bigger than B, it would be the other way. Now, this is kind of interesting. Notice that for fixed temperature uh, distribution, for fixed temperatures on the end caps, the initial temperature actually is irrelevant for the steady state fi final time distribution. So one way you can think about this is that I have some initial temperature distribution. I fix the temperature at the end caps at A and B, and this equation evolves and evolves and evolves. And we know that diffusion is going to kind of average out all this initial temperature, but because my left side is fixed at A and my right side is fixed at B, it's in the infinite time, after all you know, time has passed and I reach a steady state, there's no memory of this initial temperature distribution. It just is determined by my boundary conditions. Now that'll be a little different in the insulated case. So for the insulated case, I still have this exact same condition here. And again, we're going to use our, um, so now let's say we're, we're still gonna satisfy these boundary conditions uh, to satisfy C1 and C2. So let's take uh, U sub X and that's just gonna equal C1. And we know that U sub X at the left and right points have to equal zero. And so that actually means that C1 has to equal zero. That's a really important uh, property here, um, is that because of my boundary conditions being insulating, this constant here is zero, which means that my temperature distribution is going to be flat. It's not gonna have a cant, it's gonna be completely flat or a constant. My temperature distribution in this insulated rod is going to be just a constant. And to get that constant two, C2, is just going to be the average of my initial temperature distribution. It's going to be uh, one over L, integral from zero to L, of U of X uh, zero DX. And you could plug in T of X here. And so my, my steady state temperature distribution for insulated boundary conditions now, again, does depend on my initial temperature distribution. And I basically just get that my temperature is a constant, which is the average temperature, uh, the average of all of this initial temperature distribution. Okay, so now U equals this constant too. So those are kind of two extreme cases. If I have fixed temperature distribution, then I have no memory of my initial condition. And if I have insulated uh, boundary conditions, now I don't have this linear profile, it's a temperature as a constant, and that constant is given by the average kind of heat energy or the average temperature distribution after all of these kind of fluctuations uh, diffuse out. So what's really interesting, and this is a homework problem for you, is to start solving this if I have mixed boundary conditions. What if I have a fixed temperature on the left and an insulating on the right? What if, I have, um, what if I have an equals Q? What if I have a forcing, some steady state forcing? I just always put a blowtorch on here, and until the end of time, there's a little delta function here. How is that going to change the heat distribution in steady state? So again, if I had you know, UXX equals Q, and I integrate that up twice, I'll actually get uh, plus QX squared. So I can actually get parabolic profiles if I have these forcing functions. That's kind of interesting too. All right, so that's a homework. Um, and I guess in the next lecture, I'll probably derive the heat equation in 2D and 3D and ND, which is one of uh, my favorite things because it really shows you how Gauss's theorem and vector calculus and kind of intuition and know-how of physics allows you to der derive really, really useful partial differential equations. All right, thank you.